you know, just one second. I got to get a drink of water here. I didn't want you to have to listen to that raspiness for the next few minutes. Okay. Uh, no, knowing the heart of God and living in it, that's our, our summer series. And, and it all began with this one statement I kind of wrote on a pad of paper. Uh, this is where it began. Humankind has always sought to know God and to live in him because deep down every single human being knows that God is there. How about you? How about you? As a, and, and we'll signpost this less and less as the series get, gets going. But, but um, as, as I mentioned before, if you look at the history of humankind or the human condition, there's not one civilization that has not sought out God. I, I don't, you remember Khrushchev? I, I don't know if you remember, he was, the, he was the atheist leader of Russia, right? And, and at his funeral, uh, uh, he, you know, he was like a pheasant under glass. You know how they do that sometimes with the body? Yeah. And, and so, but, but somebody who walked by put a Greek cross on there. It's so, it was so interesting. I, I remember that picture. I think it was in Time Magazine. <clears throat> it's, if you look at all of the history of humankind, the numbers of people that have said that, oh, God isn't really there, or I don't believe he's there, is so minuscule that they become mathematically insignificant. If there was a mathematician, he would just throw them out. How about you? Do you know God is there? The Bible says that God has put that inside of us. It, it says here in Ecclesiastes, God has set eternity in the hearts of humankind. And we've always sought for eternity. We all have looked for it. We all know it's there. But the reality is that we can't find it. Not of ourselves. It says, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. What it takes is for God to come and reveal it to us. Because you see, we were created to be connected with God in relationship, and when we walked away from him, we became so lost that we cannot find our way back to him. So God comes to us. That's what he does throughout his word, and in the word made flesh, especially in Jesus. That's why it says in the first chapter of John, no one has ever seen God, <clears throat> but the only begotten son of God, he has made him known. He has revealed him to us. So throughout this series, we're, we're looking for the heart of God, uh, and we're finding it in Jesus and saying, okay, I want to receive that, I want to know that, and I want to live in it. Huh? We're looking at, at four major uh, topics, uh, and, and, uh, we're, and, and it's, it's, no, um, it's no mistake that we're kind of organized this way to do ministry as well. Huh? But we look at God, and we see that he's an inviting God, uh, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Or come to me, all you who are thirsty. God is always calling out to us, where are you thirsty? Where are you empty? Where are you weary? Huh? Come to me. Uh, and and, and we, we're going to look in the weeks following here, uh, the connecting God, how, how Jesus came uh, to do life with us to do life, when he called his, it wasn't, he didn't set himself up in a classroom and say, okay, you guys come for 10 weeks and then you're on, no, he did life with them and he does life with us, he connects with us, he calls us his dear daughters and dear sons and he does life with us, he connects with us in that way, that's what God does. Uh, and then this apprenticing or discipling God, you see that in the life of Jesus as he said to his disciples, okay, you watch me and now you're gonna go do it on your own and then we're gonna talk about it? Because you're going to be on mission with me. This is what gives your lives meaning and purpose, that you're on mission with me. And I'm going to show you how. And, and ascending God, just as the Father has sent me, I'm, I'm sending you. Right? We're, we're going to look at these aspects of God's heart and what it means for us personally uh, and what it means for us as we live it out in our lives and together as his people. We've looked at this, the abiding God, the last couple of weeks. And the first thing we focused on is it's personal uh, and I, I think this is so important. Uh, God didn't speak to us from way out, way out there. He, it, Jesus became one of us. He took on flesh and blood. And, and there, there's a mystery here. Jesus was, was absolutely true man, um, but he was also true God at the same time. So what he went through, uh, as he was attacked by temptation and sin, as, as he was attacked by the brokenness of our world, as he was tempted by Satan, as he, as he took on the, 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 the hurt and the pain and the sickness and the death of all of us, 
it's not that he did that abstractly or just as one human being. In, in some mysterious, real way, he took on exactly what you're going through right now in your life. See, it's personal to him. And that's why he would go the way of the cross. Because he hates this brokenness and this fear and this hurt and pain and struggle and this emptiness and this fear of death that we all live in. He hates it more than we do. And he would give up everything in our place personally so that we might be free. And so his invitation is personal to us. Wherever you're at, wherever you think God doesn't understand, where nobody else understands, God does in Jesus. And he comes to that place in your heart. And he gives you this personal invitation as one who is bearing it with you. That's relevant. <laughs> I, I, I love, we, we don't think of, it's, it's amazing, we don't think of it very much. I think because of the time in which we live, we're so conditioned that our faith in Jesus is supposed to be really over here in the weekend worship. Um, but don't bring it out here. Don't bring it into the public. Don't bring it into your homes. Don't bring it into your lives. And, and so somehow we think that his invitation is not relevant where he says to us, as I mentioned a moment ago, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Have you um, been there? <laughs> I mean, you talk about stuff being relevant. That's pretty stinking relevant, isn't it? Weary and heavy laden? Or come to me, all you who are thirsty. Where are you thirsty in your soul? Where are you empty? Where have you looked to go it on your own and have end up in a desert place? So interesting, when I talk like this, I see all your faces, and, and so often, you, you, I, I have to tell you, I can't look and see what you're thinking, but I see so many folks, they, they're just like, oh boy, and they kind of drop their eyes a little bit, you know? And, and I'm the same way. I got all kinds of stuff I really don't want you to see, but God sees. And right in those desert places, he speaks to you, and he says, come to me, I'm the water of life. Huh? It's relevant. And it's even relevant in our day-to-day -day relationships. As I mentioned last week, I, and it's so true. Wives, how relevant is this? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Is that pretty relevant in your life? Husbands, it's relevant for you too, right? Children, uh, respect and honor your parents' parents. Raise them up close to Jesus. Is that relevant? This life is here today and gone tomorrow. Life with Jesus is every day and forever. Is that relevant? See, this invitation is relevant. Today, we focus on this third part of this invitation. It's not something he wants us to miss. You know, sometimes when I put these little series together, this little light bulb comes on because I hadn't thought about it that way. But from, from Genesis uh, to, to, uh, to Revelation, God's invitation is like a big, giant billboard uh, with, with uh, pyrotechnics and, 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 and Fourth of July fireworks going off. He really doesn't, it's something he doesn't want us to miss. Again, I think we're conditioned to think that somehow uh, we're supposed to be a, a kind of mute and quiet and silent and, and afraid that we're going to be embarrassed. No, no, God's not any of that. He lays himself out there. If he would go the way of the cross, he's certainly going to lay himself out there so you don't miss the invitation, Right? Have any of you traveled uh, through, through the Midwest? Uh, we used to go to, to South Dakota uh, quite often because uh, that's, that's where Janie's from, to, from Mitchell. And, and what you see there is that when you have a, a, a particular a museum or an eatery or something, you have these big, sometimes it's on the side of these old tractor trailers or, or trucks. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? Like, Eat at Joe's, it's 23 miles. Eat at Joe's, it's 20 miles. Eat at Joe's, it's 17 miles. Eat at Joe's, here it is. Eat at Joe's, you missed it. Turn back. Have you seen that stuff? Yeah, I mean, again and again, and I, I don't know, we, we used to go to South Dakota, and we saw it with wall drug all the time. How many have been to wall drug? I'm curious. Yeah, okay, and, and it's really true. 201 miles to wall, who the heck cares, right? <laughs> but they don't want you to miss it. Don't miss this puppy. You got like three hours till, till you get there, right? And that's if you're driving over the speed limit. Not that I ever did. Okay, so 201 miles, uh, 25 minutes to wall. Oh, just ahead. Oh, by the way, you only live once, turn into wall drug. Right here, here it is. Big signs going up. They don't want you to miss it. 
And you see these things all over the place. This is a great one Mary found. Eden Mullerans, frog fish and chicken dinners. I don't know if you put it all together or something or if you can tell the difference between frog and chicken. But anyway, I, and I'm sure this was not the only barn they put, they put this stuff on, right? There's probably six barns. Eden Mullerans. Here's Mullerans. Come here. Don't miss Mullerans. That's God's invitation. Boy, if you don't take anything else, I want you to take this. It's loud, and it's brash, and it's got pyrotechnics, and he doesn't want you to miss it because he loves you so much. I've been reading a, a book I read a while ago, and uh, the author, he introduced a chapter with this phrase. He said, do not whisper softly the things you want loudly to be. He, he got it from a, a band. Uh, it was a lyrics in a song there. W would you read that with me? One, two, three. Do not whisper softly the things you want loudly to be. God does not whisper softly the invitation to you that he wants loudly to be. And you see it throughout the text, and you see it especially in Jesus. This, this Psalms text from Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of... Have you ever laid out under the heavens and just looked at me? This is from Yosemite, by the way. The heavens declare the glory of God. Day after day they pour forth speech... So God's talking to you here, right? Uh, there is not speech or language where their voice is not heard. He doesn't have to speak a dialogue. It just touches every human heart that I'm here. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Creation is God's never-ending voice, not whispering, but blaring at you that I'm here. It, it amazes me. Some of the, you know, there are many, uh, uh, many brilliant scientists who are Christians, and, and they, they don't, uh, they, they stand up for their creator God, but, but ma many brilliant scientists are not Christians, and, and, and they, they look at the universe, and they say, they write things like this over and over again. Well, it seems as if uh, there had to be a designer here. It seems as if this whole thing was, was designed uh, to, to support life. It seems as if there had to be somebody who put this together because if one little thing was different, there wouldn't even be any existence at all. There'd be no universe, right? It seems as if, looking at the DNA molecule, that somebody had to put this together because mathematically it's impossible. And I'm not, these aren't my words. It's impossible for it not to have arisen, for it to have arisen by chance. And it goes on and on and on. And yet, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like if you had a bright, uh, my, my son has a bright red truck, and it's like I'm, I'm living in the belief there is no such thing as red. And I look at the truck and I say, well, man, I'll tell you what, if there is a such a thing as red, that's exactly what it would look like. It would look shiny, and it would look that tint, and it would, it looks, and it looks exactly like red would look like, but I don't believe there is red, so it can't be so. It's mindless. And God, through all of this, bangs upside our head, and he says, I'm here. I've created it all, and I've created you, and his voice is so loud. Uh, um, I was, uh, maybe because I was thinking of South Dakota, but when we used to get into Mitchell, have you ever heard of Katie Dids? Wow. Have you ever heard him in the trees? First time, I, I was a California kid from L.A., right? The first time we pulled in there, I wanted to run, I wanted to run away. I thought, these guys are going to attack me. I'm dead meat. It was so loud. You couldn't possibly miss it. That's the reality of God's invitation to know that he's there and he's there for you. The day of Pentecost that we celebrate today. Just, just look at the nature of God's invitation. We, we go by this stuff, we don't, I, I want you to take this with you. We go by this stuff in the text, we don't think about it because we're so conditioned to think of ourselves being kind of demure over here and God over here real quiet. That's not God, man. He blows, he blows your doors off of creation and he wants everybody to know. I mean, this, think of how it's dis described here, this rushing wind shoo, that filled it up, fire on everybody's head. Oh, yeah, this is like so no one sees, right? Fire in everybody's head. And, and they're all speaking different languages that everybody else that, that, that were gathered from all the then known world for this festival, they're saying, whoa, what's going on here? They, have, they must have all been Lutherans because what were they saying? What does this mean? What does this mean, right? And Peter, he says, I'll tell you what, guys, sign up for a 10-week class and we'll teach you. Is that what he said? 
we'll just kind of meet in my home for the next few weeks, and, and then I'll, I'll tell you. Is that what Peter said? No, he stands up. Go put that up there. He stands up, and he stands up with the 11. You can't miss him, right? He stands up with the 11, and, and what well, he whispers. That's what it says, right? So they couldn't hear him. No, he raises his voice and addresses the crowd. This is the invitation of God to you. He doesn't want you to miss it. And he told them about Jesus, the cross and the empty tomb. And he sa- they say, what should we do? And he says, repent, change your mind. Turn away from life without God and turn to life with God. Every corner of your life live with him, see? This is how God works. When you see Jesus when he walked this earth, just, just think of this with me. We don't think in this way, and I, I want you guys to take this home. He, he starts out his ministry in Mark, and, and he says he goes out into the countryside, the crowds are around him, and he proclaims the kingdom of God is near. Now, do you think he said that quiet? They couldn't even hear him if he said it quiet. The kingdom of God is near, and the near here is, is agus. It, it's a word that not, not like it's coming, it's like it's right here. I'm the kingdom. I'm ushering in the kingdom. It's me. Come to me. This is what he's saying. Come to me right now. And not only in the countryside, but then he goes where the people are at in the synagogue. And he stands up and he... Pre- now, now, think about this. He wasn't um, educated at a rabbinical school, but he stands up and he says, I got something to say here. And he walks to the front and says, hey, I got something to say here. And so he preaches in the synagogue about Isaiah. He's up front and center. He wants everybody to know, and he wants you to know. And look how he did his ministry, right? He begins to do these signs and wonders. He, he, the first miracle he did, he turns water into wine at a wedding. Boy, that's a real quiet thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. And then the wine was good. Yeah. So, so not only were they saying, oh, man, look what Jesus did. I'll tell you, that wine was really good. They were talking about that. See, this was God's uh, uh, billboard. In fact, the, 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 lots of folks have looked at the Gospel of John and said this, this it revolves around seven of these signs and wonders that Jesus did, and they were all billboards. They were all pyrotechnics. Here I am. Here's the invitation. You can't miss this. Go ahead. He feeds the 5,000. You think word got out about that? I had five. And before the 5,000, what's really interesting, before the 5,000, there, there was this guy, I, I don't remember the story, but, but there, there, there was this guy, and he, was, he had a legion of demons in him. And Jesus casts out the demons, he throws them into the pigs, the pigs run off uh, uh, the, the cliff, they're, they're dead, uh, uh, and, and, but this guy is free. And this guy wants to follow Jesus, he wants to get in the boat with him. And Jesus says, no, you got to go back and you got to tell him about me. So then Jesus goes away on the boat, and by the time he comes back, there's 5,000 waiting for him. What do you think the guy was doing? And he, you think he was doing it quietly, by the way? What well, he's saying, I got to tell you about Jesus. I just got to tell you what he did for me. He was a living billboard for Jesus. That's true with everyone he healed. The sick, uh, those that he healed, and those that he cast out demons. And, and kind of came to a head when he raised Lazarus from the dead. In fact, Lazarus was such a billboard for Jesus that when the scribes and Pharisees were plotting to kill Jesus, said, oh, we got to kill Lazarus too. This was in-your-face stuff. This is an invitation that God doesn't, didn't want anyone to miss, and he doesn't want you to miss it. Jesus, on the last and day, greatest day of the feast, right, he stands up and he says, read what's on the line, in a loud voice. loud voice. When's the last time you thought about that? In a loud voice. You think Jesus is going to speak real softly so you can't hear him? Or you think he's going to bang up against your heart with a loud voice? If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Are you thirsty? He wants you to know the invitation is loud and clear and in your face. And if you go by it, he says, hey, you missed it. Turn around. Yeah. This is the invitation of God to you. He loves you so much. He doesn't want you to miss it. That's, it all funnels in finally to the cross and the empty tomb. I mean, think about this. Jesus... Jesus could have died for the whole world in a dungeon when nobody knew. But in the providence of God, 
He was set up high on a cross in the greatest empire that ever existed where the historians of the time wrote about it. They wrote about the darkness that covered all of the world from 12 to 3. They wrote about the earthquakes. They wrote about the, the, um, the curtain, the temple being torn in two. They wrote about people who were raised from the dead when Jesus died. They wrote about it. And then they wrote about the reality that, yeah, the tomb was empty. They wrote about it. It was not done in a corner. It was not done out in the wilderness. It was not done in a time when it couldn't get out. God wants you to know you know, it's so amazing, 2,000 years later, and people are looking at the evidence of the resurrection and they're becoming Christians. That's the books we're giving away, right? This guy was a, was a reporter for the, time, for the Chicago Tribune, and he says, I'm he was an investigative reporter, and his wife said she was a Christian. He says, well, I gotta just prove this resurrection stuff. So he looks into the evidence and he ends up becoming a Christian. God wants everybody to know the invitation is so much in your face that if you just look, if you just see it, see, you can't miss it. He's not going to force it, force himself on anybody. But it's there. It's not just 2,000 years ago. It's just not a cross on a hill 2,000 years ago. It's a historical reality that, that screams at us in all the pyrotechnics of God as his spirit touches your heart with this reality. He doesn't want you to miss it. Where do you need to hear that? It's not something he wants you to miss. Whether it's for the first time or whether it's in a place in your life where you're trying to go it alone, you, you've, you've kind of made it a head thing. Oh, yeah, I know about Jesus. But you haven't received his invitation to let him live with you in every moment of your life and to live in him. It's an invitation he doesn't want you to miss because this is what life was meant to be. We, in a real sense, we are not fully human until we walk with Jesus by this reality, this faith reality, this relationship. We were created to be complete and whole only in this faith reality in Jesus and through him with each other. And he doesn't want you to miss it. And he's loud, and he's raucous, and he gives the greatest sign that ever was. Everybody else, every other preacher, every other religious leader, they're rotten in their tombs, but not Jesus. It's the big billboard. And then he sends us out. You saw this in the text, by the way, right? Everybody who's thirsty, come to me and drink, and I'll give you the Holy Spirit, and he'll flow from you. Wait for Pentecost, I'll pour out the Holy Spirit, and then you're going out with me. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you, you'll be my witnesses, you're going to be my mouthpieces, my ambassadors. You see, we whose hearts are changed, the hearts of stone to the hearts of flesh and blood in Jesus, we too now become the ones who give this invitation. The ones who don't speak softly what we want loudly to be in our homes, in the closest of our relationships, in our communities, and, and in our world. Together, as a Christian congregation, it's not something God wants anyone to miss, and he binds us together in this place, and we go out boldly to, to hold him up. We do things like this. Go ahead. We unabashedly want to make a splash so folks don't miss the invite. So why we do extravaganza. It's why we do the Christmas events and the extreme block party. I hope you're going to be a part of that this week, this, uh, this next couple months. We need lots of help to pull them off. Banners and mailings and website and yard signs. Why do we do all that stuff? I mean, after all, it's, 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 it's not very, um, we, 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 we kind of lose something, don't, don't we? It's like, what if people say no? It's not very becoming, we're told. Why do we do that? Because Jesus did it. And if Jesus can do it, we can do it. Because we care so much, we don't want people to miss the invite. It's loud and it's brash and it's clear. And yet it's not just an invite that says, uh, y'all come. But rather each of us 
as billboards for Jesus live out our lives in this way as well. And I'm, I'm not making this stuff up. Paul wrote this, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read, read the rest of it, by all people. You are the billboard, the letter of Jesus to everybody who's around you. Certainly together, certainly the, the y'all, right? You yourselves, all you, but also, also like this, each of you in your life. You are meant to be a billboard for Jesus. Why? Because now that our hearts know Jesus, we don't want anyone to miss it. We want to be like that guy that, um, that was healed, he could see, and, he, and he's, he kept screaming, right? I was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but now I see. I was, you couldn't miss him. They say, well, he healed you, Jesus. Well, what about him? I don't know much about him, but all I know is he healed me, and I was blind, and now I see. See, you are this raucous, can't-miss billboard for Jesus. It starts with those who are closest to you, your children, and your parents, and your spouse. Where can you bring Jesus into their lives? Your extended family and your neighbor. This is who we are, and this is what we do. Because this is who Jesus is, and this is what he does. We're going to give you these cards one more week. Uh, just as conversation starters, you, we believe you matter to God. We believe you belong with us. We believe you were made to make a difference. I had a mom here the first week we gave these away, and she was grabbing sets of them for both of her boys who were in college. Uh, you might want to do that with your kids. Great discussion starters. Or with your wife or husband, huh? Or with somebody that God brings in your path who wants to talk about God. By the way, if we put our antenna up, that stuff's going to happen. They're going to come. Hey, you want to talk about this? You were made to make a difference. And God wants you to know Jesus. That's where it all comes into focus. Because finally, do not whisper softly, especially with those who are closest to you, especially with your wife or with your husband or with your children and with your parents or in your community, do not whisper softly the things you want loudly to be in Jesus because this is his heart. He doesn't whisper softly to you. He gives you the invitation every moment and every day that you cannot possibly miss and he calls us to do the same. This week, where have you forgotten the force and power of this invitation from God himself in your life? Hearing anew his invitation and being overwhelmed and awed in the reality that it is something in his great love for you that he does not want you to miss. By grace through faith, receive it brand new. And having received it, where is God calling you and us together to be his billboard? His invitation that he wants no one to miss. And, uh oh. <laughs> and we want to live. Oh, all right, good. <laughs> I, I didn't know the rest of this by heart, so I'm glad she did that. And, and we can, uh, and what can this look like in your life and in our lives together? By grace through faith, receive it and live in it. For our God is an inviting God, and he wants no one to miss it. He loves you so much, he doesn't want you to miss it. And through you, no one else to miss it either. And may God's spirit guide you this week. Amen.